So I'd like to start by thanking the organisers for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research today. And what I'll be talking is about is how we actually go about engineering human brain tissue. Uh, I have a bit of a confession to make that when I was an undergraduate here, I actually hated any lectures about the brain. And I'm not really a neuroscientist, I'm more of a stem cell biologist. But it's my interest in stem cells that has actually led to this project. So the brain is one of the most complex of all living structures. So we've set ourselves quite a challenge in trying to recapitulate the processes that the brain can achieve. More recently, President Obama and the European Union have set aside quite a lot of money to enable us to study the brain. And while this is quite a lot of money, it's probably not enough because it's such a complicated organ. I wish when we started this project that I had such lofty ambitions in trying to understand the brain. But what I really wanted to do was just build a brain so that I could kill it. So I'm not a psychopath, so don't start reaching for your phones uh, and to call the police or anything. But I was a toxicologist at the time, and my first research post was to develop new models of the brain so that we could see how toxins actually kill cells, and in particular, how they kill brain cells. And so we wanted to create models that were more like the human brain so that they, we could use them to study the action of uh, toxins and drugs. So if you're looking for sources of human tissue and you're thinking about how you can test toxins, you need to look for a variety of sources. Now, unfortunately, grave robbing is frowned upon these days, and so this limits this as a source of tissue. But if you do want to get hold of dead brains, you can go to a brain bank, and it's far more ethical to use this as a source of your tissue that you want to use. But as a toxicologist, if you want to find out how a drug kills something, you're a little bit late if you're using a dead brain to do that. And so you can't really use this at all. It's quite good if you want to look at the pathology of a disease, because you can look after a person's died and see what actually killed them or caused their brain to go wrong. So a lot of people have turned to animals, and some people would say that animal use is quite controversial. Um, animals have told us a lot about how toxins work and how drugs work and how they kill things. They've also told us a lot about how diseases work. But I'm not stating the obvious when I say that that isn't a human. It doesn't get certain human diseases. And perhaps one of the reasons that some of the new Alzheimer's drugs don't actually cure Alzheimer's is because they're based on a model that doesn't represent the disease. We can take this model and we can tinker with its DNA and we can force it to get a disease. And while for some diseases that might be a useful thing to do, things like Alzheimer's, which we don't truly understand, would limit this uh, sort of application and maybe this is why a lot of the new drugs fail. A lot of people would turn to cancer cells. Now, cancer cells are quite easy to grow and this particular cancer cell was derived from a human brain tumour. But the problem with a lot of these cancer cell models is that they continue to grow. And what you notice about the human brain is it doesn't do that. If it did, your brain would be the size of a planet. Um, so, and what's also a problem with these models is it's only one cell type because it depends on the tumour that it was derived from. So this also isn't a very good model that we could use. So in our lab, we've started to use stem cells. And over a period of about two months, we can go from a population of stem cells that continue to divide, divide into a model that creates lots of neurons. Um, what you might be able to see here are the neural networks that are formed. They're quite corporate. They try to form Ashton triangles all the time. Um, but there are also lots of cells in the background, and these are astrocytes which support the neurons. Now, there are lots of different cells in the brain. There are neurons, astrocytes, and oligodendrocytes. So if you're trying to model the brain, it's really important that you can try to include as many different cell types as you can. The particular cell line that we used uh, to create these cells was actually derived itself from a cancer, and it was a testicular tumour. And this formed a, quite an, a terrible uh, teratoma. And in these kind of tumours, you find hair, teeth, and nails. But what they also found was cells that could also form neurons as well. So it was quite a useful source of tissue. Now, for us, it was always quite important to show that our models are actually quite functional and that they not work like normal brain tissue would. So we were quite interested in the neuron astrocyte relationship. So here in green, you have a neuron, and this is a synapse, and this is the area where two neurons come together and communicate with each other. But you also have this astrocytic cell that's involved in this relationship. So when a neuron fires an action potential and wants to communicate across this gap, it releases a neurotransmitter, such as glutamate, this then binds to receptors on the other side of the synaptic cleft and initiates a signal in this part of the system as well. The astrocyte also takes part in this process in that it will also respond to the glutamate and it will change its metabolism and release sugars that would enable the neuron to keep firing repeatedly. If you block the process of lactate uptake into the neuron, you can block memory formation. So we've recently shown that this also occurs in our stem cell model, so we're quite convinced that what we're modelling is quite accurate. Now, another way in which we can look at the functionality of these cells is to use calcium imaging. 
So in this image here, you can see it's a time-lapse image, and these cells were filled with a fluorescent calcium dye. And so that when they take part in uh, uh, activity, they release calcium inside themselves, and then you'll see the cell fluorescing. And as you see the cells fluorescing, they're actually responding to glutamate. So we can see that our cells are quite functional. But this is all well and good, but these models are only in two dimensions, and our brains aren't two dimensional structures, they're three dimensional. And they don't grow in plastic either, which is the usual way in which we grow cells. So we need to think about how we design a three dimensional model of the brain. And this is where design thinking probably comes in, because we have to think of lots of different ways in which we could do this. We've set ourselves quite a major challenge. This is some of the most recent data from the Human Connectome Project, and this shows us how brain cells or bundles of brain cells are connected to each other. So each one of these threads that you see here is actually a bundles of hundreds of thousands of neurons. And you can see that this is really complicated. We could probably never dream of building this in the lab at the moment, but maybe in the future we may be able to create something like this. So in order to do this, collaboration is going to be essential. And whilst we might want to think outside the box or fill, it with, fill a bigger box with more people, we need to collaborate with lots of different people because that's the only way that we're going to be able to build this. So we work with lots of neurophysiologists. These are people that actually understand the brain and how it works. We have neural network programmers, and so these are computer specialists that can help us derive information from the networks. Stem cell biologists and molecular biologists can provide us with the cells and genetic tools that we'll need to uh, look at this model. And also chemical engineers and protein engineers and mathematicians that can help us to build structures on which to grow these cells. So we probably need to start small, and we're probably going to have to start a lot smaller than Homer's brain as well. So that lends us, leads us to the question about how many neurons it takes to make a brain. So if we look at different species, we can see that a nematode worm only has about 302 neurons, but it's quite capable of quite some complicated behaviours. If we work our way up to a human, they have about 85 billion neurons. We probably can't get that many neurons in a culture dish at the moment. What we think quite realistically we could do is about a million neurons. And so we're talk, talking about something maybe with the computing power of a honeybee. And it might not be so bad because bees can dance, so it could be quite interesting the work that we get from this uh, kind of network. So we've had a grow, go at building some of these neural networks, and we've grown them in three dimensions. And whilst they're quite pretty and they make quite nice pictures that we can show to people, they're really chaotic. It would be really difficult to understand the types of information that come out of this network. We don't know how the cells connect to each other. We don't know where the input would be and where the output would be. And when we show these to neurophysiologists or the computer neural network people, they say they would never be able to fathom the information that would come from that network. So we need to give this network some kind of structure. If we look to the brain, the brain has quite a structured appearance. And in certain types of brain, you see different layers forming, particularly in the cortex. So perhaps we could engineer something that has multiple layers. So we could envisage maybe having an input layer where we can start inputting information into the system. We have a, a hidden middle layer which could have some kind of processing power. And then we could also have an output layer where we could read out data that comes out of the network. We also need to know which neurons are talking to which, because if we have a three-layered structure, we might need to know whether one neuron just transverses the whole of the structure and goes from the top to the bottom. So we need to see where the neurons are coming from. And one way in which we could do this is to make the neurons different colours. So we have quite a talented molecular biologist in our lab, David Nagel. And what he's done for us is he's made the neurons different colours. So I don't know if you can see it very well here, but um, we have a, a protein that is derived from a gene from a fluorescent coral. And we've put that into some neurons and they're red. And then we have a green fluorescent protein that's been taken from jellyfish and so that we have neurons that are green as well. We also have now developed blue neurons and yellow neurons as well. So we have lots of colours that we can play with to start making uh, this neural network and be able to see where the different neurons come from. So again, you can see we're taking ideas from different fields and using them to create a neural network and make it easier to understand. But then we need to think about how we interact with such a system. So neurons are electrical cells, and generally when you stimulate a neuron, a scientist would use a patch pipette. A patch pipette is a really fine pipette which you would stick into the cell, and then you could record activity from the cell or stimulate the cell. But this is quite an invasive method, and if you were to do this, eventually you would kill the cell. And we maybe want to study these networks over a period of time, because if we're training networks to perform memory tasks, it may take a while to do that. So we're looking to algae for an answer. 
These particular algae have a light patch on them, and this light patch allows them to orientate themselves towards the sun, so that when a particular wavelength of light shines on them, this light patch, which has these proteins called channel reduction in them, opens a pore, and this allows ions to flux across the membrane. This enab enables these algae to beat their cilia, and this is a really bad impression of an algae, but it allows them to swim towards the sunlight and maximise their input from the sun. Basically, these algae have now revolutionised neuroscience because we are able to take these algae, extract the gene for channel rhodopsin 2, and now we've put it into a neuron. So now we can excite neurons just by using light. So we don't need to patch pipette them anymore. We could just flash lights at them instead, and this is a, maybe a much better way to interact with our system. We also think, need to think about how we design an output and how we read the output of these cells. And so what we've come up with is using multi-electrode arrays, and basically these are computer chips. This area here is probably less than a quarter of a centimetre in width, um, but within this area are multiple electrodes, um, and each one of these electrodes can detect and record electrical activity from the cells that are sitting on top of it. But because neurons will grow wherever they want to grow, we need to control this a little bit more. So we've started to create these grid patterns which will enable us to control where the neurons actually grow. And we've stained these networks in green at the moment so it's much easier to see. And this will enable us to sit one neuron above every electrode. And so when we're starting to get information from the network, we can see where the neurons have come from and maybe where they're connected as well. So, now that we've got all these different components, we're now at the stage where we can start putting all of these things together. So, we have a light activatable uh, input layer of the cells, and above that, we can position micro LEDs, and these are very small LEDs that we can use. We can also use laser light as well, and uh, collaborators at Cambridge have brought a digital mirror device which enables us to shine pixels of laser light on top of the cells. So once these cells are activated by light, they can start sending electrical signals to other cells within the network, maybe crossing to other cells that they're connected to as well. And then using the multi-electrode array, we can start to record activity from these networks. And what's quite fascinating about this is that once we've got this model working, we may able to be able to study memory in a culture dish. And it would be quite an amazing thing to see if cells in culture could actually store information. And that's what we're hoping to work on at the moment. But what I think might be more interesting is to look at how we can use this model to study disease. Now, I work in Aston Centre for Healthy Ageing, and what we're quite interested in in our lab is Alzheimer's disease. So here you see an Alzheimer's disease brain on the left here, whereas on the right we see someone who's suffering from Alzheimer's disease, and you can see this brain has suffered from a lot of shrinkage, and this is because a lot of the neurons in this brain have died. At this point, this patient would be suffering a severe amount of memory loss as well, so it's not going to be a very good for the patient, and there's no going back from this point. What we think now is happening in Alzheimer's disease is that these people have had the disease maybe for 30 or 40 years, or for people with genetic forms of the disease, they may have even had it from birth. And this is maybe another reason why some of the models don't work, is because we're not looking at the right time when we try to model the disease. Now, we can use stem cells to maybe create neurons that we can use to study the disease, and there's a number of sources that we could use. Now, traditionally, a lot of people would associate stem cells with embryos, and it's true that you could take uh, embryos or generate embryos using IVF uh, to uh, extract stem cells, and then you could use those cells from people with the genetic form of disease to study Alzheimer's, for instance. But that's quite controversial. A lot of people have problems with using embryos and destroying them in order to generate stem cells. There are also stem cells within the adult body, but the populations of these stem cells are quite small. So if you wanted to use them, you've got a really limited supply, and people are now starting to question whether they actually really do make the tissues that they turn into effectively. <clears throat> so what we plan to use are induced pluripotent stem cells, and this is an amazing new technology that has recently been developed. And in fact, the people who developed this technique won the Nobel Prize last year. So using this technique, we can take a skin biopsy from a patient, so someone who's going to develop Alzheimer's disease in their 30s. We can then, using these no famous Yamanaka reprogramming factors, reset these cells, reprogram them to become stem cells again. We're then going to take those stem cells and we trans uh, differentiate them into neurons and astrocytes. Once we've done that, 
and we've got a diseased uh, tissue, we can start to either look at screening for therapeutic agents to see if there are drugs which could manipulate the disease process, or we could actually just study the pathogenesis of the disease and see what actually occurs during the disease process. Now, hopefully I'm now going to convince you that this is going to work and that we can create a disease in a dish. This is some fantastic work that's been done at Cambridge University recently by Dr. Rick Livesey's lab. And what he's done is taken skin cells from a patient with Down syndrome. Now, the interesting thing about Down syndrome is, is that the patients develop uh, dementia in their early 30s. And this is because they have extra copies of a gene that's associated with Alzheimer's. If you take these skin cells and reset them to become stem cells again, and then you take those stem cells and you differentiate them here into cortical neurons, you can see if the disease will also progress in the dish. And what's really exciting about this work is that one of the pathological hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease, which is the so-called amyloid plaques, actually also starts to form in these tissues when they're about 100 days old in culture. So I think now that we can actually say that we can create a disease in a dish and that over a period of weeks or months we can study these cells and see how the disease develops. And I think that this is actually the future of disease modelling. So maybe we can start to reduce the number of animals that we use in these experiments and maybe use more relevant human models to study diseases now and in the future. In our lab recently, we've started to use stem cells to look at Alzheimer's disease, and we are also starting to report that what we almost see is a diabetes in the brain tissue, and this is what people are starting to think is what is the cause of Alzheimer's disease now. And so this is quite interesting that we're also seeing that with the stem cells. So as I mentioned, you need a huge team to be able to do this work. You need lots of different collaborators from lots of different backgrounds. And these are the people that we work with. So there's lots of people here at Aston University. Uh, but we also work with engineers, uh, computer neural network modelers, and stem cell biologists at Oxford University. We also work with lots of neurophysiologists at Cambridge University. And Dr. Selena Ray has provided us with fibroblasts from Alzheimer's patients that we are now starting to use to see how the de disease develops. Of course, none of this works possible without funding, and so we get lots of money from different organisations, but I'd especially like to thank the Humane Research Trust who have always supported us from the beginning. But now we've received further funding from the BBSRC to create a, huge, a healthy model of the human brain, but also Alzheimer's Research UK that are enabling us to study disease in these systems. So I'd just like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today and finish there. <laughs>